For the last 50 years, the state of Mississippi has played a very important but not always widely recognized role in our nation's human spaceflight programs. Today, I want to shed a little light on that history and then talk to you about the future of our human spaceflight programs, the role Mississippi will play in that future. Um, and that future, quite simply, is a journey into deep space and ultimately to the red planet, Mars. Back in the early days of the Apollo moon program, NASA set out to find a place to test its massive moon rocket, the Saturn V. It had a set of criteria that any site would have to meet, and they surveyed literally hundreds of sites around the country, ultimately settling on a patch of swampland in southern Mississippi. That patch of swampland um, near Hancock, in Hancock County, adjacent to the Pearl River, met all the requirements that NASA had laid out. It had water access to the Gulf so that the large stages of the rocket could be floated up. Um, it had good weather so we could test the rockets year round. It had power, water, so we could power the test stands themselves. And there weren't a whole lot of people around, which is actually very important when you're testing very large rockets. Finally, it had the support of an influential United States senator um, who happened to hail from the great state of Mississippi. It's no coincidence today that the Mississippi test facility is known as the John C. Stennis Space Center, or Stennis for short. Work got underway almost immediately on the construction of very large test stands to test the Saturn V rocket. The largest was the B complex, where the more powerful first stage of the rocket would be tested. The A complex was charged with testing the, the second stage of the rocket. As a development engineer who's actually spent a lot of time at Stennis, you know, it's always an exciting drive up in the mornings. You're driving through the trees, you don't know where you are, and then finally you come up to the Pearl River, you go over the bridge, and you see off in the distance these massive structures, and you know you're going to get to spend the day working on rockets. It's, it's a really cool experience for an engineer. A little bit of rocket terminology first. Uh, we call it the rocket. That's the big thing you see sitting on, on the uh, launch pad. We also call it a launch vehicle. All, all these are very creative names. Um, <laughs> the payload goes on top, and then there are stages of the rocket. And each stage is kind of a rocket in and of itself. It, it has propellant tanks and the, the rocket engines. The Saturn V in particular has some very impressive rocket engines. The first stage was powered by the F-1. Five of those produced a combined thrust of seven and a half million pounds at liftoff. The second stage was powered by five J-2 engines producing a million pounds of thrust. At the time, these were an order of magnitude greater than anything we had done. The test stands themselves were also feats of engineering. They had to be to contain the power of the giant rockets that they would be testing. Um, the, the B complex in particular stood at, or still stands at 260 feet tall. If it were dropped here in Jackson, it would actually be the second tallest building in the city. The rocket stages either were floated from California or from nearby New Orleans up the Pearl River through some canals to the test stands where they would be lifted up, placed on the test stands, and prepped for, for test. It must have been an incredible sight to see these rocket stages tested. Uh, it was reported that when the first test on the B complex occurred, uh, windows were shattered in the nearby town of Picayune, which was more than six miles away. Such was the power of these stages. Uh, initially, it was development testing to make sure the stages were working as we expected, and finally they started testing the flight stages. So the engineers actually got to test the hardware that would then go to, to the Kennedy Space Center and were launched to the moon. It must have been an incredible environment at that time. After the Apollo program ended, NASA shifted its focus to the development of the space shuttle. In 1975, we started testing the space shuttle main engines, which represented another revolution in rocket engine technology. We've been continually testing the SSMEs there um, since 1975, right up until nearly the end of the space shuttle program in 2009. NASA also tested the full-up propulsion system for the orbiter there, which included the big orange external tank, which we're all so familiar with from the shuttle program. Stennis, as the largest test facility in the world, has, has also tested a lot of other rockets there, and I'll mention some of those a little bit later. In January of this year, the A-1 test stand fired up again, and it represented Mississippi's entry into the next phase of our human spaceflight program. Um, NASA has set out to go to Mars, quite simply. Um, it's been a very interesting 
time in the spaceflight community over the last couple of years, we've really seen consensus build among the many, many stakeholders of our space program that Mars is where we want to go. That includes NASA itself, which is actually made up of many different parts that don't always agree. The politicians in Washington, the industry, and even the international partners have agreed Mars is the destination for humanity. And NASA is taking, I think, a very interesting and smart approach, what they're calling a pioneering approach to going to Mars. The idea is we want to make it sustainable. We don't simply want to go plant the flag and then not return. We want to create an industry that can follow and make deep space a place of commerce and of continued human presence. But the journey to Mars is going to be complex and very difficult. Uh, it's not like driving to your grandmother's house, in fact. Um, the, the trip itself will take two to three years. Uh, it will represent tens of millions of miles of travel through deep space. And quite frankly, the crew is going to have to survive only on what they bring. They can't turn around. They can't abort. Once those rocket engines fire, they're committed for those years. Anything that goes wrong, they're going to have to deal with themselves. Just to give you some idea of, uh, of the challenge, even communication is going to take long. Even at the speed of light, it takes up to 40 minutes to even send a message and get a return for mission control. Mission control is not going to be able to help um, if there's a real emergency. So what NASA's, what, what NASA's done is said, we're going to do this in phases because of the, the, the challenge. We're actually in the first phase right now, the Earth-reliant phase. We've been there since the uh, International Space Station was built. Up there right now, we're learning how to survive as humans in the space environment, in the microgravity environment. The next phase is the proving ground, and it's actually going to take place in what's called cislunar space. That's the, that's the orbits around the moon. Um, that's a very interesting place because you need to do most of the things you'd have to do to go to Mars, but instead of having to commit to a years-long journey, you can actually be there for weeks or months, and if there's a problem, you can come home in, the ma in a matter of days. So it's a good place to start testing what we need to go to Mars. Finally, and, and, and we'll spend the next decade in the proving grounds. Finally, in the early 2030s, we'll make that big leap. We'll cross the vast void from Mar Earth to Mars. Um, NASA's still working on exactly how we would go. Personally, I like the idea of first landing on the moons of Mars, being able to look down on the surface and actually tele-robotically operate rovers and things like that. I think that would be very cool. But the 2030s is when we're going to make that final leap. Some of you may be thinking, wow, 20 years from now, why is it going to take that long? Um, the truth is we don't live in the space age anymore. We live in the information age. And I think as a culture, we've come to expect that technology is going to advance very quickly. Our devices are getting smaller, more powerful, cheaper. But the truth is human space flight in particular remains somewhat of a brute force activity thanks to the laws of physics, chemistry, and in particular, gravity. Um, we can't do a whole lot about gravity except try really hard with big rockets. <laughs> Unless anybody has an idea for a warp drive. Um, so what we need is a big rocket. The other problem is we, we're bringing humans on board. We haven't figured out a way to shrink humans like we have our electronics and other mechanical devices. They still need air, water, food to survive that, those years long journey. And that's a lot of mass. So you're taking a lot of mass that's hard to get off the surface of the Earth, and you've got to send it to Mars. Humans also can't just be put into um, shelves and then open back up when we get to Mars. They need some volume. They need areas to work on the transit. All of that says they need a big rocket to get there. And that's what NASA is working on right now is the first steps to Mars. This is the Space Launch System, or SLS. I apologize. It's not the most inspiring name. I'm told NASA is working on something a little better. Uh, the, the, the launch vehicle itself consists of the core stage with four RS-25 engines, and I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, the, the solid rocket boosters, which provide the majority of thrust at liftoff. On, the core, on top of the core stage is the upper stage. That's the, that's the engine and the stage that actually sends them to the cislunar space or to Mars. And finally on top is the payload. The early flights will be flying the Orion spacecraft, the first deep space spacecraft we've actually built since the Apollo program. When the shuttle program ended, those amazing SSME engines I talked about, there were 16 of them left because the shuttle was a reusable system. NASA's putting those to use on the Space Launch System. What we're doing right now is adapting those engines to 
the SLS. The environments are different. They're actually harsher than they were on the shuttle. Um, and they also need a new brain. The, the controller on that engine was actually 1970s technology. We're giving it an upgrade to modern 21st century technology so that it can properly talk with the launch vehicle. Now I get to geek out a little bit on some rocket science. And this is what this is, what is done at Stennis. Um, it's truly an amazing engine. It generates half a million pounds of thrust in a package that's only 17 feet tall. That's a huge amount of energy in a very relatively tiny, small space. The engine burns liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to create nothing but steam. Um, down at Stennis, more humidity is not what we need, but that's what happens. In the heart of the engine, it's actually 6,000 degrees. That's, that's hotter than any material on Earth could survive. So we cool the engine actually with the hydrogen fuel that comes into the engine at minus 400 degrees. There's places in the engine where there's a 6,000 degree temperature difference separated by literally only a few hundredths of an inch. To get all of that thrust into that space, we have to pump a lot of propellant, and we do that with our turbo machinery. The fuel pump in particular spins at 35,000 RPM. For reference, your, your car engine probably spins up to about 6,000 RPM. And in a package about three feet wide, it actually generates over 80,000 horsepower. Uh, you also need a lot of pressure to cram that much propellant through very small spaces. There's, there's portions in the engine that see over 7,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. That's, about, that's like being three miles below the surface of the ocean. It's a truly amazing device. The only way you can really uh, get a sense of what it does is to see it in action. I know some folks in the room have witnessed the test, and it's truly an amazing visceral experience. You really can't get a sense of the power unless you're, you're there. And for reference, that test actually went on for another eight minutes, which is the time it actually takes for the core stage to do its job. So while Stannis is testing the RS-25s, they're also going to start testing what's the core stage with the four RS-25s attached. The first stage is actually being built in New Orleans right now, and in 2017 it'll brought, be brought to ten, Stennis for testing. It, assuming everything works out, that stage will actually be refurbished and shipped to the Kennedy Space Center. And in 2018, it will be stacked with the rest of the components uh, of the SLS rocket and dispatched on a, our first trip around the moon, where we'll send the Orion spacecraft on a test flight. So we're literally only a few years away from embarking on the next phase of our human spaceflight journey. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the other engines that get tested at the Senate Space Center because they're important for our national defense and our commercial activities. The RS-68 has been tested at Stennis for almost two decades now, and we're in development on a new engine, the AR-1, which will be tested at Stennis hopefully here in the next few years. As I said, Stennis is the largest test facility in the world, and it's a very busy place. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the why. Why do we do space travel? It's hard. It's expensive, and the benefits aren't necessarily obvious to everybody. And I'm not going to give you the canned response. I'm going to give you my own response. And I have two reasons that are important. One, you know, in the space community, we debate about all the reasons. There's the global political influence. There's the economic impact. There's the technology we generate, you know. Um, there's the influence on getting people to go into STEM, even if it's even if it's not into the space program itself, it inspires people to go into the sciences and the engineering. And also, it comes down to you know, the human desire to explore. But when we sit and debate which, which reason is the best or the most important, we're really missing the point. The reason is, it's all of those together that make space travel important. Second, I have now a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And my three-year-old, he thinks it's pretty cool that I go to work and work on rocket engines on a daily basis. I agree with him. And I can't imagine he, him growing up in a time where we aren't going to Mars, where we aren't expanding our human presence out into space. It just, I would find that completely unacceptable, and I hope you guys would too. So I'd ask you guys to think about why space travel might be important to you. The reasons might be abstract or they might be very concrete. But I think it's important that everybody has some connection to the space program, because it really is our space program. Hopefully today you've gotten a little idea of the importance Mississippi plays in our space program. 
And hopefully you've also got a little bit of excitement and new knowledge on where we're headed. And that destination is the journey to Mars. Thank you. Thank you.